You are listening to Faithless Brewing, a Magic the Gathering podcast for the Spike Road. Each week we design new decks for tournament play. We put our creations to the test and share our findings on the air. Coming up on the brew session, Capricious Hellraiser is a volatile dragon with an exciting ETB trigger. Is this the second coming of Bloodbraid Elf, a tricky combo piece, or something new altogether? That on the flashback testing results with Malkator Purity Overseer. That's all coming up on Faith is Brewing. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Faithless Brewing Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Schriever, also known as Cave Dan. Joined today all the way from Buenos Aires, you know him as Mord to Light. It's Emmy Sagasti. Emmy, welcome. Hey yo, hold on. How's it going? It's been a few weeks. Yeah, it's been a minute. How is the Texas lifestyle treating you? Uh, well... <laughs> The first thing I thought when I moved here was that the roads are pretty crazy. People drive crazy. And sure enough, someone just plowed into me on the road over the weekend. <laughs> kind of hit and run scenario. Thankfully, uh, no one was hurt as far as I can tell. But Dan is good. Miss Dan is good. Everything is fine in the important matters. Yeah, I mean, I'm out some cash because they <laughs> just sped away without exchanging insurance information. But um, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if they can be tracked down. Texas is cool. Texas is Texas. Texas is Texas. How about you? Well, living the Buenos Aires life, all good. A bit overwhelmed with work, but in a good way. So, all sailing smoothly. Well, glad to hear that. But today we have a beautiful episode after you recorded with the man in the suit, Lawson, last week. <laughs> the man in the suit. <laughs> You, you never saw Sandman streaming in a suit? I don't think I did. I totally forgot to ask him about that. Ah, such a beautiful man. Such a beautiful man. Yeah, so if you missed our last episode, definitely go back and check that one out. We had longtime friend of the show and sometimes modern streamer, Lawson Zandy, a.k.a. Zanman. He filled in and told us all about Shining Shoal decks that are all the rage in modern right now. So if you're curious about that archetype, or if you just want to hear about the Hunter Burton Memorial Open, which is coming up this weekend, uh, definitely go and check that out. We also talked about these Lord of the Rings first look cards, and I'm curious, Mord, what's your take on Gandalf and the One Ring? So my biggest take was, my first personal problem with it was the E-Set colors, but I read a Twitter explanation that calmed down any... Any issues? Of course, it's a commander card. It's not going to see any competitive play. Gandalf being five mana, too much. Basically. Yeah. Five mana, three, four, requiring extra spells. And the inset colors made no sense to me instead of something involving white. But then they, exp because Gandalf is closer to an angel than he's to a wizard conceptually in the books. So. Hmm. But they explaining it as a little picture of the moment of him f impulsively fighting the Balrog in an attempt to protect everybody at least made enough sense for me to not consider this an issue. So they do seem to be leaning into this, you know, the phases of a character's journey. Each one will, will get its own card. Young Gandalf, baby Gandalf, and then like peak Gandalf. Yeah, we have Gandalf, French the Hobbit or something like that. Um, Gandalf the Grey and of course Gandalf the White. And then they spoil the ring, which I think is absolutely, it's gonna absolutely see play in modern. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. I think the card is super good. You're feeling good about the ring? Yeah, yeah, I think it's four mana, four draw three cards. So you're imagining that four mana fogs the turn, and you can immediately tap it there for one card. On your next turn, you're drawing two cards? Yes. And then it's dead? Is that, is that basically what happens? I mean, if you're ever in a point you need to change it, you can activate it again, draw three cards, and before you ever take the three points of damage, you just bounce it without a fairy, play a second one, I get another fog and legend rule it. 
two rings plus an emery is perma protection on your opponent's turn, while also drawing an extra card every turn. How many one rings do you think we're going to be playing here? So with Voltaic Key, it's absolutely insane. With any sort of Voltaic Shenanigans combo decks, <laughs> it's also insane in any sort of Twiddle Storm deck, as likely the best way to use a Twiddle to go ahead on card advantage. You can replace card advantage spells for just more Twiddles and use the ring. You can play it in current decks as a Fog that also nets you three cards to find a new gin or an Oblivion Stone. Uh, you can turn four ring into a turn five Supreme Verdict while going up three cards and having a Planeswalker that Fog. Okay, so you're actually seriously thinking this is, this is a powerful build-around option. Yeah. There's no card that draws cards quite so easily and in such great quantities. I think the fact that it draws on your second turn two cards, like it enters, draws a card, goes up two for one. If your opponent removes it, like with a Leyline Binding, you went up one card without using any resources, without losing life or anything. So it actually makes, provides a few advantages that, that I have not seen. Indestructible is not irrelevant in decks like Tron, where you can play this alongside Oblivion Stone. Hmm. All right, I like everything you're saying. Um, yeah, you're a bit higher on it than I am, but that does make sense. All right. All right, enough Lord of the Rings. Back to Phyrexia, all will be one. So our order of business for today is we have a new card we'll be brewing around, and that is the Capricious Hellraiser. Is it Capricious or Capricious? Is it like Italian? Uh, I would say Capricious, but okay. I, like, I like the way you're saying it. Whatever you're saying sounds good to me. Keep talking. <laughs> Keep talking. Give me that Capricious Hellskite. Capricious. Hellraiser. I don't know why, because in Spanish it would be like caprichoso, so I just make it sound Italian like caprichos. Gives it that je ne sais quoi. <laughs> so the caprichos, caprichoso Hellraiser. <laughs> That's our new card, and we will tell you a little bit about our testing. We've started to test Malkator Purity Overseer as part of our ongoing monthly project. Why is an elephant a 1-1? One -one? We still don't know. <laughs> the mystery deepens. So that's the plan of attack. Uh, just before we dive in, a brief reminder that if you're enjoying the show and would like to help support us, you can always do so. Uh, you can do that by going to our Patreon page. That is patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing. We have a few tiers there. Uh, you can make a pledge at any tier you're comfortable with. It can be a dollar a week. That gets you access to our wonderful Discord community. And if you want to go to the higher tiers, we also have perks, we have tokens, we have stickers, we have playmats. Um, you can find all of that at the Patreon as well. Yeah, exactly. So if you'd like to support us, keep us going, and vote on what the next 3 mana 1 1 elephant is, our patron is always available. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right, Mord, on to the dragon, the Capriccioso Hellraiser. I'm I don't know what country I'm going for now anymore. <laughs> I've lost the <laughs> you plot. You have a tiny bit of Mexican, some Italian, a bit of New Yorker in there. It's just, you just get it all together. You muddled it up. So, the Capricious Hellraiser. Six mana, four, four, Furex and Dragon with flying. That has the super beautiful line of text that every single brewer loves to read. This spell costs three mana less to cast. If we could just leave it there, it would be perfect. <laughs> but if you have nine or more cards in your graveyard... So assuming you can get more than 9 cards in your graveyard via any method, this is a 3 mana 4-4 four, four, for red, 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 which is a relevant part of it. When it enters the battlefield, exile 3 cards at random from your graveyard, and you may choose a non-creature, non-land card from among them, and then you may cast the copy for free. So, ideally, 3 mana 4-4 four, four, cast an Omniscience from the graveyard, and not always, sometimes unluckily, 6 mana 4-4 four, four flyer cut shot your opponent's face. An omniscience or an omniscience? An omniscience. <laughs> an omniscience. I like how you say omniscience. That's that's also true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So in terms of details about the card, it's an interesting trigger, and we haven't seen one quite like it before. Just keep in mind, it is an ETB trigger, so you can do all kinds of shenanigans with it. You can blink it. You can double it up with LS Norn if you want. Uh, I think we heard David trying that in Pioneer. Uh, hmm. last week during our LS Norn week. You will have to content yourself with exiling three cards at random, and those cards are gone, right? They don't stay in the graveyard. It's not like the ones that didn't get chosen exactly. in the graveyard. 
even the one that you cast, uh, you're not casting the real thing. You're casting a copy of the one that was exiled. Yeah, you exile three cards and then you get a free copy of one of them. Yes. Now, it doesn't have to be a instant or sorcery, though. It's allowed to be an enchantment. It can even be a planeswalker or an artifact. Um, so it's actually a very interesting slice of the color pie for red. Last thing that may come up is technically this is cast during the resolution of the effect. So if your opponent has a Teferi Time Reveler, uh, you will not be casting anything off the Capricious Hello Razor. That's just the basics of the ETB trigger. There's also the cost reduction aspect, and whether or not we're going to focus on that is one of the main questions for this card. Are we fine with it being a 6-mana 4-4 four four that incidentally in the late game costs 3, or are we actually digging into the fact that we're going to make this a 3-mana 4-4 four four that Cyril should tempo us out of the game by casting something? And that's some of the, qu of the key questions behind the card. Yeah, so what do you think about that? So I have seen both sort of builds, and I have found myself more in love of the builds that put a significant number of cards in the graveyard, but can just hard cast the Capricious, and when needed, can cast it in er earlier in the game. Like, it's fine to go long game, it's fine to put cards in the graveyard, but, they may, but it can also be a 6-mana good threat, and that's the version I run in Modern. So did I hear you correctly? Is that you, you like it best when you have the ability to cast it for six, but also have the ability to cast it for three? Like you want both. You want just complete flexibility. I want text that if needed can cast it for six without it being embarrassing, that have enough lands to actually sometimes cast it for six, but in a lot of game scenarios, they can actually put this into play on turn four or five or three mana alongside a bolt or something. Like you can double spell with it in the mid game. So in theory, any control deck will have the ability to eventually accumulate six mana. You don't have to do anything special. You don't have to ramp to this if you're willing to play a longer game. But you could also just put in some ramp elements. Fable of a Mirror Breaker makes a lot of sense, right? That gives you some treasures and puts stuff in the graveyard, puts itself in the graveyard sometimes, uh, and it can be rebought off the Hellraiser. So I think that would be like a, a nice little bridge card. So are you saying you don't like the options where, you know, you're, you're laser focused on surveil, surveil, mill, fill the graveyard so I can cast this for red, red, red? Yeah, making sure this is an early game red, red, red threat. That's one of the first link and the list we're going to discuss, I think. Hmm. So what, what is your favorite way of casting the Hellraiser, Dan? Are you looking to just tempo it out? Are you looking to turn to persist it? Just go on full and insane? Not persist. <laughs> Part of what it is is that, like, the trigger is, is very unique in what it's looking for. It's looking for non-creature, non-land cards. There are just not that many effects that can actually do that. Like, if you're actually returning a planeswalker, returning an enchantment, returning an artifact... Yeah, it's not easy. What do we even have to compare this to? Like, you can refurbish something? Trash for treasure. Yeah, you can trash for treasure if it's an artifact. You can refurbish if it's an artifact. If it's enchantments. Enchantments, there's what? Like, there's Obsidat's Aid, I guess? There's, there's not much. Yeah, there's rarely any. There's an interesting little combo that we'll, we'll get to when we get to the deck list. This is technically capable of returning Eldrazi Conscription, which, you know, we, we sometimes hmm. see paired with Storm Heralds, so that is some redundancy there. But that's the question. Like, does this build any redundancies like is it more copies of something useful or are we actually if we're going to try to reanimate something specific is hellraiser the only card that can do it a good example is let's say i'm playing pioneer and i really like the idea of recasting an extra turn spell like part the water veil or recasting magma opus if it's magma opus torrential gear can do that but if it's specifically the sorcery extra turn spell like only the hellraiser can do that so it raises a lot of questions, and I don't quite know how to solve that. Um, I think it's, it's probably just easier to just sort of wash our hands of the whole thing and be like, all right, whatever, I'll just <laughs> try to recast a lightning bolt once and just be happy with a, you know, a decent body and a small bit of card advantage. But what, I'm really intrigued by like reanimating something specific, and that does require getting to six mana and having a, a relatively small graveyard. All right. 
Also, it's worth noting that, in specifically in modern, a sparring spike fell in love with the card, and he has been pumping out proofs like daily on a daily basis since release. I think this was his his favorite card. <laughs> it was just from the very beginning. Yeah, this was. He, he described it on day one as a three mana blood red elf, and just stick to his guts and try to find a new shell for it almost daily. So. While in modern, most of our work has been cut down for us, in Pioneer, the Drake has been mostly unexplored. Yeah, it actually has not achieved any 5-0s. No results in Pioneer so far with the Hellraiser. Um, but maybe it's just a matter of time. Could be. Yeah, it could be. All right, so other things to think about before we get into the specific deck lists. What are some of the best things to reanimate? If you're going to go for small spells, you want to choose things that are proactive, that will just give you some advantage, no matter what the board state is, right? So that means not counterspell, basically, but yes to Archmage's Charm. Like, Charm would be great. Lightning Bolt is okay. What's really cool is if you can sort of sneakily get a big effect into, into your graveyard, right? Something that didn't cost you that much to put it into your deck. But once you get it into the graveyard, the Hellraiser gets you a huge advantage. And I think Aspiring Spike immediately latched on to the, uh, what do we call those, Mord? The double face lands. Yes, MDFCs. The mythic ones, specifically the white, blue, and green ones. The beautiful bolt lands. The bolt lands, yeah. But specifically Amaria's Call, Turn Timber Symbiosis, and Seagate Restoration. These are the proactive ones. Yeah, and these are the ones that are nice to cheat into play because they cost like 7 or 8 mana. Right, right. So if you just somehow get one of those into your graveyard, Hellraiser recasting a turn timber symbiosis finds another Hellraiser, perhaps, or something else. Uh, if it recasts the white one, that's 3 4 four is all of a sudden. And if you recast the blue one, the Seagate Restoration, you, you drew a bunch of cards, potentially. So that's very exciting. And low cost, too. So it, if we're going to go anything more specialized than that, like if we say, okay, actually, I really want omniscience to come back. Now we're talking about setting up like a specific A plus B combo that can be attacked very easily. And I think that's probably less robust use of the Hellraiser. Yeah. And we can always look for in-between things. Along the lines of MDFCs, things that have cycling are a, a great idea all right so david mentioned how when he played his pioneer capricious hellraiser Elish norm deck he really wanted cast outs as many as he could find right he only had played two copies of cast out and he, he felt like that was just a mistake he should have played all four just because every time you draw it it's pretty easy to just put it in the graveyard and then now it, you've got like a nice effect for the hellraiser to get back okay in both formats shark typhoon plays that role some people like that uh you know the card more that's four blue blue draw four or it cycles for one yeah the one from ikoria moon of the wish giver that's it boon of the wish giver so something like that where if you're if you're willing to just take a little bit of time to cycle something uh, you can definitely like juice up the graveyard for a hellraiser hmm. but those cards don't really do anything besides that yeah i don't think i have ever seen anyone harcast a boon of the wish giver <laughs> it, it's a sorcery thing even Oh, yuck, it's a sorcery. <laughs> Six mana draw four cycling, one and colorless. Good old colorless cycling. It's the kind of card that we, we could have tried in, like, the Mind Splice apparatus decks. Like, there's, like, another half synergy, right? Like, if we think of Mind yeah. Splice as a, as a big mana engine slash cost reduction, Hellraiser can kind of be that, too. Like, you know, you can just sort of mix and match these things and... Maybe come up with something special. I don't know. And sometimes the sweet spot was right in the middle. Exactly. There's other weird stuff to consider. Like, this is a dragon, so if we want to give Rivaza the Claw one more chance, there's maybe a dragon tribal thing to do. <laughs> uh, more of you were describing dragon storm lines. I don't know if uh, that's actually worth considering. No, no, dragon storm has seen no love. I was waiting someone more combo oriented than me to work on it. And I have been disappointed large and wide. Yeah, I mean, the Dragon Storm itself is, is quite tough. I have seen people in Pioneer looking at the, the Sultai Ultimatum, the Emergent ult Ultimatum, because a Hellraiser is a monocolored card the Ultimatum can find. And then it can recast Ultimatum? 
Well, I thought so, but it turns out the ultimatum exiles itself. So. Oh, look at that. They were balancing cards. They sometimes remember to balance their cards. But the Hellraiser can double the other thing you find. I don't know if that's worth it either. <laughs> hmm. um, so like things like this you could consider. Uh, or maybe it's Genesis Ultimatum. Maybe it's not Emergent Ultimatum. Yeah, yeah, but I, I got the one you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, they were saying, we, we should endow creativity for this, and it will be so much better than the existing shell. I don't know. Hmm. There's a lot of... You can dream big with this card, for sure. You can absolutely dream big. <laughs> the last thing I want to say about it, is just as a, at a high level, is that red, red, red is significant. You'll be a lot better off just playing two colors. Getting any more colorful than that is going to be quite tricky. And if you look at, like, Aspiring Spike's many lists, he's always playing these filter lands. He loves filter lands. Yeah, and they're usually not that good, but in these decks, they're, they're kind of important. <laughs> but sometimes you have to, play, to pay RRR. Right, like he needs to filter his turn timber symbiosis green mana into double red to cast, you know, a sequence of Dragon's Rage Channelers and Capricious Hellraisers and such. So just be aware of that. It's a significant cost. Yeah. Okay, deck lists. Do you want to start in Modern or in Pioneer? We can start in Pioneer, we can start with the new stuff, and I think you will hate the first deck, so I'm all in <laughs> on some done hate. Alright, hit me. What do we got? Capricious Form. The name provided by our largest Pioneer Brewer. And I'm gonna read just five words from the comment before going on it. Stuff that Dan wasn't particularly fond of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As per usual. Dan, why do you oppose success? I just don't like people to have fun. That's the problem. Why do, why do you fear progress? <laughs> so David is referring to Nia forming for Atraxa. Actually, we talked about this in, uh, in the previous episode with Lawson, because it turns out <laughs> that that Nia form Atraxa shell is actually kind of good once you just make a few tweaks. The Pioneer cues are infested with the deck right now. So th there's something here, but this is a, a different take, a very different take on the Nia form shell. Yeah, so... This one evolved into a bit of a Sultai version, if I'm not mistaken, from this Timur one, right? Right now, the lists being played are more black-based. Yeah, the lists that are being played right now are um, very, very focused on Sultai colors. They just go hard on that and try to get their anglers into Atraxas, but here we have something a bit more elaborate, if I'm not mistaken, right? We're not going 6 to 7, we're going 5 to 7. Or actually, 5 to 6 to 7. <laughs> So, how do we do that, Dan? Sell me on the capricious form. Alright, are you familiar with the card Perennial Behemoth? Sadly, I am. 2-7 for 5, artifact <laughs> creature beast. You may play land cards from your graveyard. That's Ramian Up Excavator. We know that all of that is flavor text. It has Unearth, and the Unearth is GG. So, very curious that it's a 5-drop that Unearths for 2. There are not that many cards like this. Ox of Agonis is a similar one, although that has a different role. This one doesn't require that much setup. You just get the Perennial Behemoth into your graveyard at any point. You unearth it. You can immediately then play another land from your graveyard. And then you have until the end of the turn to make something useful out of that 2-7 body. Actually, not 2-7. It's actually out of the 5 mana cost body. We don't care about its combat stats. I don't care about the combat stacks, I don't care about the beast, I don't care about the actual text of you may play lands, we care about it's a 5 CNC creature with an earth for 2 mana. Exactly. One thing you can do is you can Eldritch Evolution, your perennial behemoth, and jump all the way up to 7. I think David first tried this during Arc Arcane Proxy Week, it was, yes. it was kind of silly. <laughs> but what's new is that Capricious Hellraiser provides an intermediate step. And that means that instead of relying on Eldritch Evolution, which costs three mana, and that means we can't do this until turn five, with Neoform, you can do it a full turn sooner. So let's say it's turn four, you have three lands in play. You unearth Perennial Behemoth, play your fourth land, immediately Neoform the Perennial Behemoth. Now you can get a six. A six is not a seven, but we're getting there. What six do you get? Capricious Hellraiser. Unlike Eldritch Evolution, Neoform does not exile itself. It actually stays in the graveyard. So the Hellraiser comes in, exiles three cards at random, but we've already taken care of both the Behemoth and a land, so hopefully we have a very good chance of hitting the Neoform again. If we hit the Neoform again, now we go up to seven. 
and that's a Traxa. If we don't hit the Neoform, we just have a 5-5 five five Hellraiser. Okay. And maybe that's good enough. Yeah, sometimes a 5-5 five five flyer on current 4 is more than you need. Yeah, you got a bonus land out of the deal too, so it's a good value play. Yeah, you can do it with only 3 lands in play, you can get your free land drop of the perennial before sending it on its way, so even if you get 2 for 1 with a removal, you actually got 1 for 1 because you drew a land in between a bunch of quotes. Sorry, by a counter spender or removal. You can also get you can also get blown out by a removal though. On Hellraiser, but that's another part of it. Oh, instant speed removal. Interesting. Yeah, I suppose. Uh so we've mentioned four Neoforms, four Perennial Behemoth, four Capricious Hellraiser, and three Atraxa. What's the rest of the deck? Well, we gotta set up the graveyard in some way. So David is proposing to use considers and is it charms? Is it charm not great? But again, we're not looking to have a huge graveyard. We, we kind of want a small to medium-sized graveyard. So the Is a Charm is like, okay, well, when we find the Perennial Behemoth, we can easily discard it. But in the meantime, it's just like a decent play. And it's sort of proactive. You know what I was saying about Archmage's Charm? Like if Hellraiser happens to just rebuy an Is a Charm, that, that's worth something. Beyond Is a Charm, we need a little bit of defense. So Fiery Impulse, three copies. Obviously... We would prefer to have Fatal Push and Thoughtseize, but in Team or Colors, Impulse is probably the best we can do. We do, however, get access to Fable of the Mirror Breaker, a beautiful card with Hellraiser, and just a beautiful card in general when you're playing a combo deck. The Fable gives you something great to do when the opponent is like focused on the unfair thing you're doing. And four Hooting Mandrels. That's kind of the last piece. Plumby. Exactly. Gives you a chance to like bypass the behemoth. You don't need Prino Behemoth. You can just do some stuff for a few turns, eventually draw your Hooting Mandrels and Neoform. Just delve to cast the Mandrels and Neoform that, just like the good Sultai version. Good old three mana get an attraction to play. A bit less creative, but it works. Exactly. And Attraxa will get all kinds of stuff here. It'll get an artifact, it'll get an enchantment, it'll get instants and sorceries and lands and creatures. You'll, you'll get it like a full hand. You'll be discarding the hand size when this happens. It's six, right? You get artifact, enchantment, creature, instant sorcery and land, yeah. That should be enough to get you back in the game, alongside a 7-7 seven, seven flying vision as the Thatch Life Linker. That's the hope. Um David managed to squeeze in one copy of Stubborn Denial uh for that post attractor scenario and one thirst for knowledge. The mana is gonna be tough. I mean, there's no filter lands in Pioneer, so you're just looking at just atrocious mana. But he did manage to squeeze in two copies of the green MBFC, Turn Timber Symbiosis. Other things to note is that you do have some interesting jukes. So he put a single copy of Niv Visit Perun, the six mana Niv, um, the kind of control hmm. killer Niv Visits, uh, so that if they're expecting you to go for a track site, you can maybe surprise them with uh, Niv Visit Perun in, in game two. Neoform Perennial Behemoth into that, and you should be fine. So yeah, it's super weird builds. Definitely going to be a little bit clunkier than the Sultai one, but a lot more stylish. This is that, that little chain sequence that everyone always hopes they can do with Goblin Dark Trailers until it's pointed out that the Eldritch Evolution exiles itself. <laughs> but you can do it like a little a different staircase, right? The Neoform staircase, 5, 6, 7 into Atraxa with the Hellraiser. I mean, it'd be a beautiful thing. Also, my bad, Atraxa will be an 8-8. Eight, eight. Because Neoform has some spicy decks that comes up from time to time. That's right, it did, yeah. <laughs> All right, so that's a highly speculative but very cool teamer Neoform list. From there, we move on. And we go lower into Mardu Refurbish. A bit simpler, right? A bit more elegant of a solution. Yeah, tell me about this deck, Morg. So we have a Mardu sort of mid-range deck list, the usual for Thoughtseize, for Fatal Bush, for Harvester, and the for Fable, as you would expect in any reasonable Rakdos deck in Pioneer. But alongside that, we have four Imeria Skull, four Scrap War Mat, and of course the four Hellraiser. But what is the plan with it? What are we trying to reanimate? Well, in this build, Hellraiser is working as Little Brother to refurbish in an attempt to get back one of our four copies of Portal to Phyrexia straight into play. Yeah, this is so interesting. Refurbish and Hellraiser are both capable of returning a giant artifact, so you have eight ways to get back the portal to Phyrexia. Four copies there, sure. Refurbish and Hellraiser 
kind of part ways at that point. So the Emeria's calls have nothing to do with refurbish, but they are very cool with the Hellraiser. So you kind of, you might as well put them in because they're, they're kind of free. I don't know. Are they free? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> you have a, lot, a good amount of discard here, right? You have Blood Tithe Harvester, Fable, and four Scrapwork Mutts. That provides a lot of access, access to the draw discard effect. And a one of Celestus because David loves the Celestus. It's a legend, but the first copy is free, baby. <laughs> the free copy, the best possible mana... Um, what's the name of it? Manolith. Yeah, exactly. The, the first strictly better Manolith. Not, not the first, but the one we actually want to run. A legend among Manoliths. And it has a little bit of a looting built in, and it gets you that little bit of ramp so that you can get your turn five hardcast capricious Hellraiser. Yeah, and a lot of the time, if you're like... Turn 3 played a Fable, you might even, like, you go turn 3 Fable, turn 4 Celestus, it's super easy to turn 5 just hard cast a, a Hellraiser and get back a portal to for exit to close the game. So what do you make of this choice of top-end package? Like, talking specifically about Refurbish and Portal to Phyrexia, four of each. Do you think that will win the game? I think so. They are likely the best ones, right? Like, right now in Pioneer, what would you feed? So the other option, and this is something that I saw uh, Fire Series Robert Taylor messing with, is you take those exact slots, Refurbish and Portal to Phyrexia, and you just say Grease Fang and Porhelion. Exact 8 for 8 swap, and now we kind of have the same shell. Like, it's, it's still got the blood tokens, still got the fables, still got the black interaction, Scrapper, Mutts, all that's there. But you have, like, that, that kind of free Grease Fang win that happens very quickly. Okay. Like, which of those do you think is more likely to win the game? I guess that's my question. Yeah, I do think the better payoff is Portal to Phyrexia, right? Especially in this deck where you're actually discarding stuff like extra extra hell races and extra threats. Well, threats in between mm. a bunch of quotes, but... My only problem here is... Oh, and when you get back a Hellraiser, there's always the idea of getting back Immeria Skull. So the first Hellraiser gets you back Portal... And the ones that continue from there that got returned with the portal actually get you stuff like Emilia Skull, which is two four four flyers that, as we have learned from Grisfang, if done fast enough, it's actually enough to just win games. So you're saying that you actually do get the Grisfang angle here. <laughs> Amiria's call, you built your own Grisfang with Capricious Hellraiser. Okay. Capricious Hellraiser getting back Emilia Skull is build your own Grisfang. Okay, yeah, I mean, why not have it all? Why not go for the goal? It makes sense. I mean, the Hellraiser gives you that extra layer of reanimation redundancy. It is probably going to cost six here, right? Like, I don't think we're realistically going to get nine cards in the graveyard. No, I can only see that, like, in the mid game. Like, I can see a turn seven where you play a three mana Hellraiser alongside a Refurbish. I don't think that's impossible at all. So, to me, that says this is going to be a much slower deck, right? There's really not oh, even yeah. a possibility of a quick kill. Yeah, but. You might be able to just be fine with being a slow deck, considering you have four push, four thoughts, four harvester, as ways to interact alongside the fact that getting back a portal on the turn enters is a semi. How do you say? One sided. One sided wrath. Yeah, that's true. So it's like you have tools to stall. And it is nice how the enabling creatures, Blood Height Harvester and Scrapwork Mutt, I mean, you're, you're playing them for their own skills, but they both work nicely with Portal. They, they keep your graveyard full. Uh, they both work nicely with, with the back half of the Fable, so you can copy them for value. If you ever start copying Hellraisers for value, um, you know, you have a, a pretty good amount of draw discard effects, so you can yeah. keep having things to find. At first look, I was a bit afraid of being short on like actual ways to win the game, but Fable, Hellraiser, Emiria Skull actually like start adding up pretty fast. All right, so two interesting takes in Pioneer. Uh, again, a format where, where we have not seen much from the Hellraiser yet. Uh, most of the ideas that I had seen were in that is it space, you know, thinking of Hellraiser as another copy of Torrential Gear Hulk. But uh, I kind of like what Dave is doing here. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, and from there, I think we can safely move to modern where a bunch of work has been done, and I actually did a bit of testing on some of the builds. Okay, so tell me about what you play in Mord. So at first we start with the pretty promptly named Capri San Boros. <laughs> I 
I don't know if this name has caught on or ever will caught on, but do, do you have these in Argentina, Capri Suns? No, we don't. It's a juice box, but for some reason it's a pouch instead of a box. Yeah, I have never seen anyone drink from a pouch. I'm going to be frank here. We, we have like some more cardboard boxes, juices, like reasonable countries. I mean, I hear what you're saying, but this is like a, a status item. <laughs> you brought this in primary school? Like if you're a third grader, a fourth grader. And you are like MVP. You are instantly granted a title. You are like the best around. You became a cool kid. Yeah, you're rolling up with your, you know, if you got like a Lunchables, you ever had a Lunchable? Like these are expensive, expensive lunches. The cream of the cream. A Lunchables and a Capri Sun. Like you knew you were a popular kid if you had those. The rest of us chumps are like having a, a homemade healthy peanut butter and jelly sandwich that, you know, our parents. But you, you had the MVPs, you had the spicy, the spicy shit, the Capri Suns. The things I would do for one sip of a Capri Sun and like one little processed cheese and crackers square <laughs> from, from somebody's Lunchable, you would be amazed at the deals that go down to the lunchroom. I mean, isn't the best part about being old that you actually can afford to do that if you desire? <laughs> Why are you not doing it? Well, I'm a vegetarian now and I don't think they make vegetarian Lunchables. <laughs> but, but they do make vegetarian Capri Suns, so... See? You can have the Capri Suns because some cheese or something nice. So, Capricious Hellraiser and Blood Sun. That's the joke. I forgot to mention that. <laughs> Capri Sun. But yeah, tell us about the deck mode and tell us how it went for you. So, I got a 4 1 in my first league with it and it actually felt pretty good. So, we have. To start with, we have the 12 card package that we tend to see in a lot of Boros decks for Fury, for Solitude, for Ephemerate. That's like a must in order to say so with this sort of deck list. But then we have the bit of Spice. We have eight of the MDFCs, the Boros ones, four Imperial Skull, four Balakut Awakenings, alongside four Rust Pale Bridge and four Flaxons of Trocare. So we have 16 special lands that we're trying to do stuff with alongside four Lotus Field. Not only that, we're playing four Boombast and four Cleansing Wildfires. So as you can see, this decklist has a bunch of weird stuff happening with the lands. So the idea is you either get your Lotus Field into play sacrificing Flaxons of Stroke Air, or you play a Blood Sun and then you play a Lotus Field, or you do something like turn one in Miria Skull, turn two, tap in Miria Skull, try to make Solitude Ephemerate to survive an extra turn, and then on turn three play a Lotus Field. So this puts two in Miria Skull in your graveyard that when you play a Capricious Hellraiser, you're getting that back. And then of course we have four Fables of the Mirror Breakers, because why wouldn't we have four Fables of the Mirror Breaker? It's Fable of the Mirror Breaker. Yeah, we're playing it here over Season Pyromancer. Because you can get it back with Hellraiser. I had the initial doubt of why, and then I realized we have 13 creatures already, and we need to make sure we don't hit a creature or a land. Yeah, it's a great target to get back with the Hellraiser. It provides a little treasure ramp. Um, so, you know, maybe you ramped once with that Flagstones of Trocare into Lotus Field play, and then you ramp again with the treasure. And before you know it, I mean, you've got enough to, like, hard cast a Hellraiser and Ephemerate it right away. So you have, like, eight soft synergies alongside Flux and Soft Trocares. You have both Lotus Field and Cleansing Wildfire. But also you have the four Boombas. So you have Flagstones plus Boombas plus Cleansing plus Lotus Field. You also have the Artifact and Destructible Bridges alongside Boombas and Cleansing Wildfire that also enter on top with the Blood Sun. So there's a lot of minor synergies that constantly add up. Yeah, I mean, all those like little synergies are things you can work for. Then there's just raw brute force. Blood Sun immediately plays an untapped Lotus Field. You can do this in Pioneer, but what you can't do in Pioneer is all that tricky stuff with boom bust, indestructible lands, and flagstones. Yeah, there's a ton of ways to like do tricksy stuff with your mana. And what's either cool or infuriating is that in Modern, right, if you don't need this stuff, if you don't need the Blood Sun, you just pitch it, pitch it to Fury and you know, wreck somebody that way. So it looks like it's kind of cobbled together, but I'm actually very impressed at the levels of little cross synergies here. Yeah. That's what I realized as I played the deck. Like the 
individual strategies are not particularly powerful. Cleansing Wildfires plus Lotus Field and such has been tested a bunch and has never shown great results. But I have never seen it alongside Boombas, for example, which actually makes a lot of sense, considering they both work super well with Flagstones and Bridge. So when you've played this, you got a 4-1. Um, like, how were the games playing out? Was, was the Hellraiser an important part? So I managed with Rondon Iset on the back of just Solitude Ephemerate, you know? Sometimes they just have, like, a super fast turn 2 Ledger Shredder, turn 3 Shenanigans, turn 4 Mortide Hold Up Counter Spell, and I just went, like, okay, Cleansing fight Wildfire your land, so they t lose one of their open mana, and I went Solitude Ephemerate, and they just lost the game. Cleansing Wildfire works as a soft title, everybody. It's a relevant use of that card against Counter Spell decks. Oh, just like pointing it at one of their untapped lands? Yeah. Okay. Round 2 was my loss, ironically, to Primeval Titan, which seems like a stupidly good matchup, but they just had the turn 2 kill. Ouch. So nothing you can do there. Round 3, I just destroyed a Mono White Human's deck, the one with the places with the shawl. Because most of this deck is exile based removal, and I just managed. I had like a super fast hand of Solitude plus Ephemerate on game one, and on turn three, I just played a fair game like Pitch a, Solid, a Fury in the early game, play a Blood Sun, turn four Lotus Field, Hellraiser, get back, like Balakut Awakening, change the, the land destroy spells in my hand for more gas, and then I found an Ephemerate, Ephemerate, Hellraiser, get back in Miria's Call, and just run with the game. Yeah, Valakut Awakening like surprisingly good effect, you know, if you're just sort of getting it for free. It's always worth at least one card, but it, it flushes as much of your hand as you want. Yeah, and in this deck you start drawing bad, like, boom bust in the late game unless you actually have enough mana to bust this super bad. Cleansing Wildfire is a two mana retro spell generally. Worth noting, you're not running a lot of basics. So you can't Cleansing Wildfire, yeah, one mana and two planes. Flagstones does look for Sacred Foundry, so that's not the problem. The problem is when you draw one basic and then you use two Cleansing Wildfires and you're out. Hmm. So it's worth noting that a lot of the time it's good use to start throwing Cleansing Wildfires at your opponent in the mid to late game, especially when you play a Hellraiser and get back a Cleansing. A lot of techlists nowadays don't play more than one or two basics. Yeah, that, very true, very true. So that's at least worth considering. Yeah, and worth noting that the Hellraiser is allowed to cast Bust. So yeah. if, if you happen to hit that, you can. You can Armageddon right there. So round 4 and 5, I just played against um, Mono Green Tron, which I, of course, destroyed, because I have 4 Cleansing Wildfires, 4 Boom Bust, 4, and just... If I'm not beating Tron with 8 main deck um, removal spells, and game 3, I just did, like, turn 1 Fury Frame Rate, turn 2 Cleansing Wildfire, kill them. Like, a bit of scamming on my part. <laughs> You kept the Furies in, well, wow. okay. Yeah, because if you keep the four Ephemerates, you keep the Furies so, so you can win on the back of turn one Fury. Because you have eight two mana um, land destroy effects, so if you can get a turn one Fury, as long as you disrupt turn for one turn, you might get the win on the back of that. I was a bit sad having no reach, which is a thing that scared me slightly, but I'm not sure what I would replace for some sort of reach. That's the main issue. Yeah, I mean, Lightning Bolts could play it, but I don't think you should. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, deck works surprisingly well. Got a nice 4-1 out of it. Lost a game I consider I should have won in 90% of scenarios, but the turn 2 is the turn 2. Yeah, nice result there. Yeah. So this is a, a list that has 5-0, I, I think it might have been originally Aspiring Spikes list. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, it is a Spike one. And from there, I think we can go to what Spike called the best um, Capricious Hellraiser deck. Yeah, so this is more of a is it control deck. Not immediately obvious to me that you should put Hellraiser in this deck, but it <laughs> seems to really work. So in modern, in is it colors, you're gonna play considers lightning bolts, unholy heats, counter spells, Always. and expressive iterations. That's that's kind of locked. And Ledger Shredder. Ledger Shredder I mean, yes and no. Like some of these lists have them and some don't. I, I think I've seen three or four different uh five O lists that have four Capricious Hellraisers and that selection of blue-red spells. Some also have a secondary threat like Ledger Shredder. One has like Telerian Terror even, uh, which is kind of interesting. What they don't have is they don't have the cheap Merktide stuff, right? So they don't have Ragavans, they don't have DRCs, they, they don't have Merktide Regents. Uh, instead, 
you're using those slots for slower, bigger spells. So Archmage's Charm, right? I mentioned that already. Fine Counter Spell that also becomes a draw too when you Hellraiser it back. And Shark Typhoon. A card that, you know, it's fine. Like if you're not in any rush to do anything, you can make a little shark, and then later getting that back off the Hellraiser is probably going to win the game. Some of the lists put a, a miser's copy of Boon and the Wishgiver, and some don't. Okay. I mean, it's beautiful when you get it back, and the one mana cycle isn't, like, devastatingly bad. It's bad. I'm not going to say it's good. Yeah, you can. I'm not defending one of the gift giver as a fair card. I'm just saying. One mana cycle for colorless could be worse. Well, what do you make of this version from a Freak You Nasty? Freak You Nasty is not playing the Boon of the Wishgiver. It looks like they're playing Seagate Restoration instead. So my, my biggest problem with the Seagate is the three damage can really hurt you. But, but it is thick that getting it in the mid game once you have three or four cards could actually be backbreaking for your opponent. I actually like it a lot more than in any other shell I have seen for it. Yeah, so it looks like Freaky Nasty is treating this as part of the mana base. 17 lands plus the four, yeah. or plus three Seagate Restorations. But sometimes you can just consider it into the graveyard. So I think he's seeing the upside on it being discardable to Shredder or just lure, or just surveil away with Consider as high enough for the upside that a lot of the time with Hellraiser you might just cast a Seagate Restoration to be worth it. Yeah, that makes sense. And yeah, I can see why, why this build does play the four letter shredder it's just an all-around solid card and it gets you out of these early land land light scenarios so you have the the four shredder four bubble that has been tormenting Mord for many months now <laughs> i will never admit my defeat i actually have done so in the past so i haven't i haven't tried this shell yet but like what role does the hellraiser play in this shell right it's the only for sure four of top end threat I think you're just trying to be... Like, my biggest problem in this field with Hellraiser, is it actually better than good old Murktide? Probably not. You are less vulnerable to spot removal, of course, but... Yes, it's probably not better unless you get lucky. Like, in, unless you happen to get that Shark Typhoon back. Or the Seagate Restoration. Actually, if you get an Argonist Charm, I think it's also better. Really? You take a 4-4 four, four and 2 cards over a Murktide? Yeah. And 2 cards, yeah. With an expressive iteration, if it's in the late game and I have spare mana, I would. But it's when you start getting into the frisky territory, right? Like, might be insane, but then you hit like a Shark Typhoon and Julans and cry. Hmm. But yeah, I do think an Archmage Charm plus a 4-4 four, four Flyer is actually super worth it for 3 mana. Like, a Divination that leaves you a 4-4 four, four Flyer. A 4-4 four, four Flyer in Modern is an actual threat. It's bigger than most creatures you will see in the format. Yeah. And we have one final deck list that I think it's more up your alley because of your love for scrapwork mud mostly. Love some scrapwork muds. Yeah, the little dog is in a lot of these lists. He's great. That card has seen an insane amount of play. Like, it actually has been a bit of an all star in format. So, this is another one of the. Uh, aspiring Spikes little projects here. He's been obsessed with Capricious Hellraiser, and it's just, it's really cool to see. I mean, I didn't believe him at first because his first couple attempts didn't go that well, but the more he played it, I think he, he figured out how to make it work. So in this Gruel list, Gruel Storm Herald, I mean, the Hellraiser was actually pretty good. <laughs> like, watching him play this, the Hellraiser, I have to say, the Hellraiser was pretty good. So tell me about Storm Herald combo, Mord. So the combo here is quite simple. Storm Herald has always been a 3 mana 3 2. When it enters the when it enters the battlefield, you get to equip all the auras from your graveyard into it, and then they get exiled on end step, right? Pretty much. You get one good hit in. One little yeah. detail is that the Storm Herald can put the auras on anything. It doesn't have to go on the Storm Herald. Okay, perfect. And it's a 3 2 haster, so the moment it enters the battlefield and if your brain doesn't have spot removal, you can get all your auras from the graveyard equipped. But we don't care about all the auras, we care only about one aura, Eldrassi Conscription. Which, as, alongside a huge body to boot, is it plus 10 plus 10 or plus 8 plus 8? Uh, plus 10 plus 10. Plus 10 plus 10, Trample and Annihilator 2. 
Which means if turn three you are getting back a three two haste with this, you are actually presenting a thirteen damage swing alongside your opponent sacrificing two permanents. I sell yes turn three. It's usually not lethal by itself, but it's like tends to be game winning. Like the game might continue for another turn or two, but they'll be on the brink of death and they'll be down resources. So what is Pike's plan here? Well, if you're gonna have to feed your graveyard, why not play stuff like? Traverse the Ulven Wall if you're going to enable the Delirium with stuff like Commune with the Gods, Crab Work Mat, um, Dragon Rage Center, and Miss Probable, and then have Hellraiser as both a value creature that can get you stuff back like Fable, a Redraw, a Bolt, or a Turn Timber Symbiosis so you can go find another Hellraiser or a Storm Herald, or even the Drastic Conscription back on itself, or any creature you have that is able to attack. So this gives you two avenues of playing the game, either a much combo a much more combo-oriented path with Strong Hair plus Eldrassi Conscription, or a more fair plan B alongside Capricious Hellraiser. Yeah, so he's definitely set himself up to fill the graveyard. Like he's oh, yeah. very likely to cast Hellraiser for red, red, red. That means he's not gonna have control over what he gets back. Right? He, he did put two copies of Become a so that in, in theory you can respond to the Hellraiser trigger with become immense delving away the bad cards but that's not likely to happen more likely you're getting a random card but there's enough good stuff in here four turn timbers and three traverse means seven copies of effects that find another hellraiser or yeah. find a storm herald or whatever um the eldrazi conscription we want to put that on storm herald but if you put that on a hellraiser itself um or actually i mean hellraiser lets you cast anywhere you can put it on anything you can cast a hellraiser hit the conscription put it on a scrapwork mutt and swing that way Eldrazi Conscription is a tribal enchantment so it's like randomly contributes two to Delirium which is like actually very hmm. good in this deck yeah yeah. it's just kind of wild to see how this all fits together and then of course we have four of the fire lit thickets we need that red green filter land so that this turn timber symbiosis doesn't look foolish in a deck that's often going like Dragon's Rage Channeler Bolts Hellraiser in the same turn like red 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 Four fables and four scrapper monks to hold things together. Commune with the gods makes a lot of sense. It just digs you pretty deep. Um, again, you, you may reveal the Eldrazi conscription from Commune with the gods, and you don't have to take it. You can decline to take it. You can just find nothing if you want. Because um, it's better in the graveyard. Yeah. So I have seen with the last two, um, sorry, not particularly with the Iset Peel, but this one alongside the Boros one are like, a perfect mix of small interactions, right? Like every card you see has some nice interaction with another one. Yeah, this one is also full of small interactions, but it's it's going for that big swing, right? That big finish. Yeah, yeah, it's it's more show-offy than the Boros one. That's a bit more subtle in its small interactions. Exactly, exactly. High risk, high reward. This one probably just completely folds to graveyard hate, and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's it's fun, and just watching him play this, I was I was amazed at uh, how well it was working. So very cool to see like Capricious Hellraiser just working despite the randomness, right? We don't need to control it. We just need to give it enough good stuff that it, it's always going to do something good, and sometimes it just wins the game. Yeah. All right, so there's some ideas for modern, a couple for pioneer. What are you thinking now about the Hellraiser based on what we've seen, Mord? Well, I actually think the card might have something to it. Like, it's powerful, but if only it had been like six cards in the graveyard instead of nine. <laughs> it's like, if only it just said this spell costs three less to cast. If only it had only said this spell costs three less to cast. I mean, wouldn't that be a useful... I mean, that's basically Leyland Binding. It's just like, yeah. this spell costs five less. Binding always says cost three less to cast. <laughs> I have never seen anyone cast a binding for more than four mana. Like even with a blood moon, it's planes plus mountain. Yeah, so we can we can dream of this future <laughs> just cost reduction. <laughs> no context cost reduction mechanic. But until then we have to actually meet conditions to get the cost reduction. Yeah, so a more powerful Hellraiser would, would maybe be too powerful, because it, it looks like good enough. You know, not broken, but fun and has a lot of utility and a lot of ways to build it yeah and I, from there i think we can go into the card of the month 
which actually we have been putting a bit more work. All right, Malkator Purity Overseer, one white blue, legendary Phyrexian elephant wizard, a legend <laughs> among elephant wizards. How is a Phyrexian elephant wizard a 1 1? It's a 1 1. That's all you need. <laughs> when you're this pure, when you're this legendary, 1 1 is all you need. When Malkator enters, create a 3 3 Phyrexian golem artifact creature token. And then at the beginning of your end step, if you had three or more artifacts entering the battlefield under your control, you get a bonus golem token. So, a uh, better but a Sodius Blade Splicer. Exactly, exactly. The first Pioneer Legal Blade Splicer, I was not sure if this was just like a weaker Blade Splicer, but having played it now, I think it's way better. It is, it is so much better than Blade Splicer. I am shocked at how much better it was. I mean, if you can only, if you can get it, if you can get the second trigger, like one in every three, that's it. That's insane. Like three mana, seven, seven stats is insanely powerful. So I played a build that I really liked and I triggered the extra golem all the time. But before we get to that, let's, let's briefly check in on David's notes here because he started with a less promising, less successful shell. <laughs> And it looks like he had terrible results. So he was interested in the Esper shell, and we talked about this cool line you can take with Sran's expertise and Demelkator, and maybe you have Kaya Ghost Hunter down, and you double all your tokens for the turn, etc., etc., etc. Pair that with Deadly Disputes and Shambling Ghasts and Rite of Oblivions and Thought Season Push and yada, 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 yada. At the end of all that... I said, David, just just cut the bad cards, cut the expertises, and just play it like a normal deck. I'm sure it will be fine. And it wasn't fine. Now, right, Darth Boys in the background. It wasn't. It wasn't fine. He did take my suggestion. I hesitate to call it advice because the results were terrible. But he went uh, one two one two one two one two for a total of O and four with this um, much more fair Esper token sacrifice deck. So reading David's notes, what I think pops up the most of, uh, about Malkador is that its biggest advantage over something like Blade Splicer is that your opponent has to kill it eventually. Like sometimes just leaving it there um, as a soft 1-1 one -one is going to net you an extra 3-3. Three -three. So unlike Blade Splicer, that if you're not trying to blink it, the opponent can ignore it. Here you might just go stuff like Thrabber Inspector and Deadly Dispute Sacrifice a Shambling Ghast and that's gonna net you four, three artifacts and your opponent now has to point a removal at a 1-1. One, one. Yeah, so it looks like David has divided his comments into the good, the bad, and the... Well, it's gonna the ugly, but the, the questionable fixes. The ugly fixes. So the mana was good, that's a positive. Right. We talked about the challenges of splashing a third color in Pioneer, but between the treasures from Deadly Dispute and Shambling Ghast, he said the mana was not a problem. Opponents having to kill the Melkator, that's good. Targeting Melkator with Charming Prince, that's good, right? Prince was a new addition. You know, he added the four Charming Princes and went up to four copies of Phyrexian Flesh Gorger to try to, like, do something unfair that way, but it, I guess it just wasn't unfair enough. Just falling a little bit short, round after round after round. The bad. What is bad? Well, there's a, a Seekers Chariot problem, right? We, we said this during our last week's show that you, you cannot just have Melkator be a bad a Seekers Chariot, and one a Seekers Chariot does almost as much as like a fully powered Melkator plus two golems. So David apparently got outclassed by Chariots multiple times. <laughs> Looks like one opponent even had Alana and Helena partners, which, yeah, that, that'll get you. Yeah, alongside a Chariot. And it looks like he found that the deck just starts off really slow. Like, none of the one and two mana plays are proactive, so you're not able to, like, get on the board quickly and apply pressure. You end up having a, a slow clock, and unfortunately, a combat thresher continues to disappoint. Um, looks like I was wrong about that card, because uh, once again, we tried it, and once again, it was terrible. So sadly, it has been going down the sink. All right, looking at any fixes from David, what, what do we see here? So, at first sight, he's not sure he was just in pain. You can also see that the four losses were one twos that he felt w were close enough in a lot of scenarios. Mm. He really felt like the four, w the o four was undeserved, which makes making changes on your first league kind of hard, especially after he says he mulligan a bunch. But the most important thing is he thinks the whole sacrifice package might be a bit too clunky. 
and then maybe just playing better creatures or better synergies without going so clanking to the sacrifice, shenanigans might be better. Okay. Yeah, I mean, maybe this is just the wrong direction to take. Yeah. However, the next, li- the next deck list had a bit more promise. promise. So why don't you tell us about it, Dan? All right, so staying in Pioneer, I tested Melkator in blue-white artifact aggro. This, this used to be like a Tezzerator show. I think when Tezzeret Betrayer of Flesh was printed in uh, Neon Dynasty, we were very excited about the card and built a bunch of different concepts that all used Tezzeret as like a curve topper card advantage engine, can apply pressure with a minus two to like beef up these patchwork automatons or clue tokens from Thrape Inspector or whatnot. The more I play this, the more I realize that the deck is great, but Tezzeret sucks. Like, Tezzeret is the problem. <laughs> That's the only problem. Yeah, it's surprising, right? So I played two versions of this, just straight up blue-white. The first one with Tezzeret in the deck, the second one replacing Tezzeret with better cards. I mean, they both felt great, to be honest. Like, I went 4-1 with Tezzeret in the deck. Without Tezzeret, with, with an improved build, I went 4-1 again, although I timed out one of those rounds with attacking for lethal so a david robertson 4-1 we'll call that <laughs> it's technically a 3-2 <laughs> but um but yeah like once i had tweaked the numbers i was just crushing people like i just dominated most of these matches so what are we looking at here we have ingenious smith patchwork automaton portable holes four copies of all of those four copies of melkator Ingenious Smith to get Darksteel Citadel, so we have four of those in our mana base, and then yeah. the other 19 lands are... We're looking for blue-white duels. Um, More color resources was insane to add the uh, Dungeons & Dragons artifact land. I found that, like, four Darksteel Citadel was, was enough. Okay. I also found fun that you could make treasures to grow the Malikator. Now that you mention it, maybe I should just replace the Darksteel Citadels with the Treasure Vaults? Yeah. Is the Indestructible more worth than 6 mana make a 3-3? Three, three? Or like 4 mana make 2 artifacts plus a combat courier? Yeah, I totally didn't even think about that. In the first version, when I had Tezzeret in the deck, obviously you want to make it Indestructible 4-4. Oh yeah, so of course, it, it 100%. Makes sense, but now that Tezzeret's out, I think Treasure Vault yeah, is a great call. Alright. What's the supporting shell? Well, Emery Lurker of the Lock and Mox Amber. This is very important, right? Now, David kind of hates Emery. Like, he's been betrayed by it so many times. Hmm. It just dies and, like, leaves you with broken dreams. But in this show, like, it, it kind of works. The real key that holds everything together is Skrelv Defector Might. Oh, go on. You know, it's, it's like the Pioneer's Giver of Runes. It's an artifact. It reduces Emery. It's a legend, so it turns on Mox Amber. We're now playing so many legends that the Mox Amber is, like, actually super good. So I played two Ambers in my first shell and I, I ran it back with three embers the amber is like super good here so you have yeah scroll reality tip oswald onctus Emry, and malgador exactly exactly um so replacing tezzeret with unctus uh was was a big upgrade i put two unctus in and i think maybe it would even go up to three now having played it malgator that being your turn three play followed up with a mox amber and any other one man artifact right that's just a very easy way to get the extra golem. I got so many extra golems. Like, I was triggering the bonus golem two, three turns in a row in multiple games with this. And that happens because, because of Emery, it happens because of Reckoner Bankbusters drawing cards, and especially because of Combat Courier. Combat Courier was so good. Like, David had put two in his proposed shell. I wanted to go up to four, so I just immediately up to four, four copies of that. Emery finds it. It just like becomes like that. Even if you don't have mana to unearth and sack, it's often enough to just unearth it. Just unearth it to get that third artifact trigger for the turn. And it's yeah. like you're unearthing an extra golem. When you're like in this mid-game scenario, so what would often happen in previous versions is that we'd do some stuff, but then they would play their stuff and their stuff is just bigger than ours. Hmm. Now, because of Melkator, like gumming up the board with golems, like there's not really a good attack, so we're just staring at each other. But I have these card draw engines, and they don't, right? Like, I have an Emery engine that they can't kill anymore because I have Skrelv. They gotta kill Skrelv first, and then Emery just gets the Skrelv back. Unctus, right? Unctus, this card is so powerful. I think we're definitely gonna do Unctus next week. It's super promising. It turns that, like, modest board presence from the Melkator into just, like, a huge board presence 
that is like attacking and triple looting. Like I got a turn four kill against Lotus Field on the draw, and there's just nothing they could do. Like I just overwhelmed them. Who ever heard of a turn four kill from like a blue white artifacts deck? It's just you just don't see that in Pioneer. Um, but it was like Scroll of Turn One plus Mox Amber let me play Melkator turn two, and then turn three I played Unctus. Immediately paid six life, attack with everything, triple looted, found my third land, played a land, played Emery. I got to discard a combat courier off of that sequence. The combat courier, when I unearth it, comes back as a 2 2 because Unctus buffs your artifact creatures. Yeah, I thought I was so shocked that you could afford, that you could perform a turn four kill with this deck. I was shocked as well. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've never seen a Mox Amber be so good. I have never seen a turn four aggro kill in Pioneer in a non like fully dedicated aggro deck. Yeah, it was shocking. And then you had like a turn five with damage to spare through a gargoyle. Like you had a few combinations that are like shockingly aggressive. Yeah, I mean, I was never losing the battlefield war. Like that's the, wow. One of my Lotus Field opponents, like they they kept a hand that played a gargoyle immediately. So like normally that would actually steal a game, but as soon as they did that, all I did was I like, just did a Malkator sequence and made two golems <laughs> and now they just couldn't attack and they were just like staring at each other while I kept drawing cards and doing more stuff and like before you know it the game was over you still have to interact of course um but it turns out there's plenty of good artifact interaction um so I kind of had put this speculative Oswald package in there so that I can you know I have one Oswald main one sideboard so that I can like find my damping sphere more often find my stone brains uh find my Soul Guy Lanterns or Unlicensed Hearse, etc. I tried a, a Citizen's Crowbar, actually. It was pretty good for killing Chariots, killing Fables. Yeah. Like, super versatile. Yeah, so this, this is feeling good. I do love how good Combat Courier is in this deck, because I just freaking love Combat Courier. It's such a fun card. Such a nimbly, stupid little guy that does so much work a lot of the time. Yeah, I, I think you would love this deck. If you love Combat Courier, you would love this deck. I think I have to take this deck for a spin. I will take this deck for a spin tonight. Good old Asorius. And then we have one final deck. Closer to what we had discussed in the two, a few episodes ago. A bit more in the four-color Essica Stadiot Malgator shenanigans. Is this one of D. Jeff's lists? Yeah. So D. Jeff got a 3-2 with a list featuring four Gilded Goose. 8 2 drops that make artifacts for Gada Greeters for Purpose in Keeper alongside 2 Bank Busters and the 3 drop slot Saheli Rai, Fable, and Malkator. So we're trying to do the good old Essica's Chariot Saheli Rai trick where you copy your Essica's Chariot, transform it, and then copy itself when you get to copy a token. So you get an absurd amount of cats. It's 6 cats, right? I believe so. 6 cats and a token copy of Chariot. And a token that you get to keep. Yes. And then you combine that with Elish Norm for like 12 cats. <laughs> because nothing can go wrong when you have an army of cats. So the detail is like at the lower part of the curve. I think DJF MTG made some slightly different choices from what David was proposing. DJF is going for full set of Gala Greeters. The Gilded Goose, kind of surprising. And for Prosperous Innkeeper. All of these are ETB triggers, so they're very good with Elish Norm. These Conclave Tribunals are kind of interesting here. I think I see a note from DJF that they actually felt pretty good. Yeah, so he was able to cast them for free a bunch of time because of the absurd amount of cats plus a token or like a, an Elish Norn. Like going turn 4 Essigas Chariot into turn 5 Elish Norn Conclave Tribunal was sort of a common play pattern. That's disgusting. That allows you to get rid of two stuff for free and like fully control the board. So tap out for Elish Norn, but immediately convoke the tribunal and kill two things? Yeah, sort of the modern... Sort of the version of, mo of in modern Elish Norn plus one mana Leyline Binding or Solitude. Solitude at home, as we call it. Interesting. Yeah, you could also build this to be a Leyline Binding deck. I, I know that uh, D. Jeff was looking at different mana base configurations, and if you just copy the mana base from like the five-color Omnath to Light deck... You could just do that and play Leyland Bindings, but I don't know if that's... I don't know if you want to fade that. Yeah, I mean, maybe just maybe just try Conclave Tribunals. It's interesting. So, 3-2 is not bad. I know DJ has been trying a ton of different stuff. He's really led the charge on Nakator so far. I've seen about 15 different lists proposed. <laughs> this is the most good stuff of them all, and it's definitely using a lot of combinations that I'm interested in. So I'm, I'm very yeah. keen to, to track 
the progress of the show. The card that intrigues me the most is Calagritters. I'm not sure how consistently you can trigger it, but Calagritters into Malkator does look sort of the dream. Well, you get one artifact from that, right? You don't get two. You get one tap treasure and one... Why couldn't Malkator be an artifact? <laughs> it would be a bit strong. Like, turn two Calagritters, turn three Malkator, get a treasure, get a second golem, win the game. So there is like a... There is a card called Mycosynth. No way. You are never playing the four man enchantment only for that. No, it's not an enchantment, it's an artifact. Sorry, we are not playing a four mana artifact. I would rather make more three threes with my four mana spell. Well, it works with the Sahili Rai combo, though. Because it turns everything you control into an artifact, it allows Sahili to just copy herself. So it's kind of like an extra copy of your Luxior Giada's gift. Now, I wasn't that keen on this, but I, I think it might have been DJF or some other people. But some people in the Discord were, were proposing lists around this, and it looked kind of good. Not like in huge quantities. Um, what's the name of this card board? Mycosynth something. Lattice? No, that's the banned one. Well, whatever it is. <laughs> it's four mana, it's three and a blue. Okay. Yeah, and it works with Malkator too. It, it makes it quite easy for Malkator to get bonus golems. So, more food for thought. Maybe we're charging off in strange directions. Maybe that's a good sign. It's a time to wrap up this episode. Yeah, maybe it's time for us to end with today yeah. and go on with our merry lives. So, Dan, thanks so much for having me, everybody. Thanks for listening. And I hope you have a beautiful night. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Decklist for this episode can be found at our homepage, faithlessbrewing.com. And tune in next time for our testing results, plus the latest technology in modern and pioneer. Support for this podcast is provided by brewers like you. Join the Faithless family and help support the show at patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing for Discord access, bonus content, and more. That's all for today. Stay safe and we'll see you next time.